Hello and welcome to this episode of our Rhinoplasty for Residents and the Foundations of Facial Plastic Surgery webinar series. We really hope you have a great time watching this show. Uh, it's great to be here and uh, kudos to you for incredible organizational skills and uh, uh, really taking the lead internationally on putting together incredible virtual learning opportunities while we've all been uh, sheltered at home around the world. Uh, this is serving not only as a great educational opportunity for us all, but also as a great way to bring communities together that otherwise wouldn't be able to come together, not only during pandemic, but also uh, uh, for various other reasons, uh, bridging gaps. And so perhaps one of the ultimate silver linings of the great work that uh, you guys in South Africa are doing are really uh, creating a cohesiveness uh, and turning the pandemic into a positive opportunity for uh, cultural interchange, um, development of relationships, and of course, uh, last but not least, certainly is the educational uh, opportunities that this is uh, allowing us all. So thanks so much for, uh, for doing that and spearheading it, and it's great to be here with you. I'm gonna uh, cover endonasal rhinoplasty approach over the next uh, 25 or 30 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions, uh, and then we'll listen to Brian's uh, talk on tip surgery. So when we talk about endonasal rhinoplasty, at least up until the last couple of years, I used to get the sense when I would go to meetings that this was somewhat of a thing of the past. It just wasn't spoken about. There was not a presence on the stage at many of the meetings regarding endonasal rhinoplasty. Uh, here's a picture of Jock Joseph in the operating room. Uh, Certainly he had nice results documented in textbook that he wrote on the subject. Uh, and so to me, it was obvious that there's a longstanding tradition of endonasal rhinoplasty that should and does hold a place in the hearts, minds and practical applications of many surgeons. And so there certainly were a lot of giants who developed the techniques. For example, here's Irving Goldman, who is a master of endonasal rhinoplasty He's uh, credited with uh, a lot of uh, vertical dome division techniques uh, that are attributed to him and that he really led a generation in the 70s and 80s in North America that's, that focused on endonasal techniques. And so incumbent upon us as students of rhinoplasty uh, is to adopt the tried and true successes of past surgeons who were outstanding, skilled, innovative uh, in their time. So it's on us as their students to take on what was successful and recognize also that as a result of those interventions, there were many tens of thousands of very satisfied patients over the course of decades. Uh, and so I believe that there is a place for endonasal rhinoplasty, despite the fact that there are many shortcomings of the operation. For example, demonstrated on this slide uh, is one of the shortcomings, ALAR retraction, uh, where we can see the nostril margin is clearly retracted uh, 25 or 30 years after rhinoplasty that was done by an expert rhinoplasty surgeon. Uh, this one happened to be from Mexico, uh, but it's not for us to reject the entire operation as many of us have recognized more in the last few years, but to embrace the successes, but recognize the shortcomings of purely reduction rhinoplasty. Here's another example of a similar operation uh, that resulted, this is a North American patient, resulted in polybeak deformity that was in turn res the result of tiptosis. So we can see the drooping of the nasal tip that leads to the super tip becoming the most prominent uh, part of the uh, uh, dorsal uh, profile view for the patient. And as we all know, what we really want is for the tip to lead the super tip and the dorsum by about one or two millimeters. Here's another example, five years after rhinoplasty performed in the United States in the Midwest, and we're starting to see early changes of ALAR retraction, uh, and we're able to see some other changes of aggressive reduction of the middle third of the nose, saddling of the nose, early onset uh, inverted V deformity. This is a woman 25 years after a similar operation, and we can see more exaggerated ALAR retraction, perhaps an over-reduced dorsum, uh, although to some of us, that's an acceptable, uh, even today, uh, dorsal profile and relative position of the tip uh, re relative to the dorsum. 
Another major problem and shortcoming of endonasal rhinoplasty is the asymmetry of the nasal tip. And the reason for that is that as you get to the tip anatomy, first of all, asymmetries that exist preoperatively are present more often than we recognize or admit to. And so we really need to become experts at reading through the skin, having transparent vision, x-ray vision through the skin to really see the cartilage with our eyes and also to palpate the cartilage and to recognize the differences in the cartilage strength and the cartilage positioning. And a failure to do that at times could lead to asymmetries. But the greatest reason for asymmetries are that through the endonasal approach, it is admittedly more difficult to gain symmetry because the access is limited more so than the external approach. And so even if you pass sutures that are perfectly symmetrical, which we know are not gonna be perfect because of underlying asymmetries of the face and technical alterations, we are not perfect as sturgeons. And so uh, then you compound that with healing asymmetries and irregularities where even the slightest partial millimeter asymmetries of tip suture or underlying cartilage are then exaggerated because of the wound healing forces that are gonna compound those asymmetries. And so long-term, you're gonna have contracture that leads to more, uh, more defined and more obvious asymmetries. So we, don't, we have to recognize first and foremost the shortcomings of the endonasal operation and also recognize where can we intervene in ways to prevent long-term uh, uh, shortcomings. And so, for example, ALAR retraction can be correct with the addition of alar rim grafts. Ptosis of the nasal tip can be corrected and prevented uh, through the building of very, very strong tip support. Polybeak deformity, similarly, uh, if it's the result of tip ptosis and supra tip fullness, we can again build excellent tip support and uh, do a proper dorsal reduction, not too much, not too little, and make sure we tape the nose so that we avoid the soft tissue polybeak, perhaps uh, provide the patient with steroid injection in the early healing phase so that we can get rid of the edema that ultimately may lead to long-term permanent scar tissue that may lead to polybeak deformity. Saddle nose deformity, get used to visualizing the dorsum through the endonasal approach so that you can produce a very precise um, uh, reduction of the dorsum that's not too much and not too little. And some surgeons like to, to utilize the endoscope to bring their eye under the skin flap and then directly be able to visualize it. Other surgeons with experience learn how to use binocular vision in order to see under the skin flap that you're able to elevate nicely through the intercartilaginous or transcartilaginous incision that is connected to a very generous transfiction incision that allows mobility of the soft tissues of the nose so that we could um, see the dorsum very, very nicely. Inverted V deformity. We want to be rather conservative in our reduction of the dorsum and in application of spreader grafts and in performing lateral osteotomies to close the open roof and prevent the saddling that sometimes is accompanied by inverted V. And of course, through good visualization and conservative periosteal elevation, avoid separating the upper lateral cartilages from the nasal bones. And as I mentioned, tip asymmetries minimize tip manipulation when possible. In my opinion, not every nose needs aggressive tip surgery. Most noses can be managed with very conservative tip refinement. And by doing that, we can provide maintenance of their preoperative symmetries, prevention of complications of surgery where we introduce new asymmetries into the nose, and we can strengthen tip support and, and uh, use other techniques to create symmetry at the end of the operation. So I would say up until the recent past, it was argued, argued quite strongly at very uh, prominent meetings uh, by very bold yet dogmatic surgeons, endonasal versus external. There was bloodshed on the screens when people were defending their practices of endonasal versus external operation. Bloodshed on the stages, I should say. Uh, but today, we really need to embrace endonasal and external if we want to be complete rhinoplasty surgeons, in my humble opinion. Why both? Because both are successful, 
both can yield outstanding results and both have a result depending on the specific needs of the patient. For me, all of the patients listed here are achievable through the endonasal approach. And if we had more time, I would go through each and every one of these. I'm gonna highlight some of them over the course of the next uh, moments that I have for the presentation. Uh, but in particular, because this is a resident uh, lecture and an early one in our series at that, I wanted to highlight some of the anatomy that's important to consider for any rhinoplasty, but specifically as it relates to endonasal rhinoplasty. So of course we know that there are lower lateral cartilages seen here occupying the lower third of the nose. Notice that the lower lateral cartilage uh, veers from the alar margin superiorly so that a portion of the alar rim is not uh, occupied by cartilage. There's just soft tissue here. In fact, you can see the um, roots of the vibrissae for the intranasal hair on this anatomical dissection and the margin of the lower lateral cartilage where we would make the marginal incision has an irregular border and this is true in all patients uh, and it goes out here and it you can see the cartilage narrowing as you go out laterally so changes to the tip cartilage that we would i would recommend would be maintain an intact uh, lower lateral cartilage as much as possible perhaps remove a little bit of the medial cruce here perhaps a little bit of the cephalic margin up here, but preserve as much of the lateral cruise untouched so that you don't have problems with ALAR retraction. Why would that be? Because removing tissue from an area here of support for the nose creates a tissue void. And the uh, rules of wound healing are that in the presence of a tissue void created by removal of cartilage, there is going to be scar contracture in the direction of greatest support. Where is the greatest support in this nose? It's up here. If we remove cartilage from here, the cephalic trim. So the, what is going to happen during wound healing is upward rotation of the tip of the nose towards uh, the upper lateral cartilage, which is more stable than this freely mobile lower lateral cartilage segment. Uh, and if you take a medial portion out, we may also get narrowing of the tip of the nose because of the wound contractile forces that will occur over time. Also notice the length of the nasal bones. That's for me a very important element to consider when we're talking about the technique and the specific intervention for the nose. If there's a patient with long nasal bones, I'm very comfortable being very aggressive with the bony work on the nose, medial and lateral osteotomies to narrow aggressively, because middle third support is gonna be maintained very strongly. Uh, why is that? Because if more than let's say a third or even a half of the nose length is occupied by bone, that is outstanding support for the sidewall of the nose. And we're not simply relying on the upper lateral cartilage for support of the middle third of the nose. So that's a huge benefit for us. The amount of, upper la of uh, bone length is going to also determine the amount of strength of support of the upper lateral cartilage. Why is that? Because the longer the nasal bone, the greater the degree of overlap between the nasal bone and the upper lateral cartilage. And that overlap is providing good long-term solid support for the middle third cartilaginous segment of the nose. The other pearl that I have anatomically is that absolutely the septum is the key to nasal surgery. The septal part of the surgery is often relegated to the most junior resident in the room. And to me, that's a mistake because to me, the nose is determined, the size, shape, and obviously function of the nose is determined by the septum. So uh, that is for me, the most important part of rhinoplasty. And finally, looking at the bones again, we recognize that the nasal bones, what we call the nasal bones or the bony segment of the nose is occupied by the nasal bones themselves and the frontal process of the maxilla. And ideally, osteotomy would be performed as close to the nasofacial groove as possible. So in most cases, that's going to be frontal process of maxilla more so than nasal bones themselves. We also see the inferior turbinates. I think they're important to recognize 
here as an anatomical unit, very worth preserving and maintaining rather than destroying and, um, uh, and removing. Why? Because the function of the nose physiologically is determined by the surface area of the lining, which provides for the physiological capabilities of the nose, including warmth, humidification, filtration, in order to maximize gas exchange in the lungs. And that is uh, the preferred method of oxygenation is through the nose, not through the mouth. So we want to maintain the, um, the air purifier and the air processor intact. Uh, so important to recognize the turbinates from a physiological standpoint. My personal indications for endonasal rhinoplasty are listed here. Pretty much all dorsal work, all septal work, all bone work, all spreader grafts, struck grafts, batten grafts, rim grafts, minor tip refinement. I find the endonasal approach, which is the ultimate preservation rhinoplasty approach, uh, is achievable for me for all these areas. Whereas the external is useful to me in select cases of severe twists of the nose, in cases of short nasal bones that are particularly twisted, because I really want to fixate the spreader grafts in a way that's going to provide support where there is no overlapping support between the bones and the upper lateral cartilages. And finally, for major tip work, in particular, if there's a symmetry or severe bifidity that I know is going to be difficult for me to get perfect symmetry and really, really finesse at the tip shape. I won't hesitate to open a nose. Uh, I love doing external rhinoplasty and I'm happy, perhaps at times happier, I'll admit, with some of the external approaches for these more challenging cases at the tip. Uh, and for some tip grafts, although oftentimes doing tip grafts through uh, the endonasal approach is very doable. So let's go step-by-step step for endonasal rhinoplasty uh, as I want the residents to feel very comfortable uh, with the um, philosophy and the practical steps of it. I start, of course, by inspecting the nose visually and then by palpating the nose with my fingers. And here I'm determining the extent of the, the strength of the bony portion of the nose and the strength of the middle third of the nose. And I'm marking out in my mind's eye and for your demonstration purposes on the nose itself where the spreader graph support is mostly needed. And I'll make sure to go a little further so that they're situated under the nasal bones. I've also marked out the limited amount of cephalic trim that I wanna do in order to achieve a medial uh, displacement of the uh, medial crura to narrow the tip and very slight rotation at the tip. I'm gonna make an incision, a hemitransfixion incision of whatever variety you are comfortable with. And then I'm gonna elevate the submuca perichondrial flap utilizing a freer elevator and then work my way back to the bony septum and beyond. And here's what it looks like in an actual patient. So the uh, uh, incision is made, the hemitransfixion. I identify the septal cartilage. I score it with a 15 blade so that I can get under the perichondrium. And here's the scoring until I get that crisp white look. And then I'll introduce a freer elevator, make sure I get under every last fiber. And that's an opportunity or that's a point in the operation that I would say, take it slow here. This is where you wanna make sure you get in the right plane so that you don't have problems with perforations and you have a nice, strong, robust flap. There's nothing wrong with taking your time at points in the operation when you need time. And once you get into that plane, it's very easy to unzip the septum uh, in the right direction. And then you can identify easily the pathology where there's obstruction of airflow. Here's a significant septal deviation. It's at the floor of the nose. So there's likely a maxillary crest contribution here as well. So we're gonna remove cartilage and remove maxillary crest bone in order to get a, uh, an airway that's patent. And here's the cartilage exactly as you saw it intranasally removed in order to create an airway that's stable. I often also will separate the bony cartilages junction and then treat whatever bony deviations are present at that time. Now here's a standard appearing uh, illustration of the textbook appearance of what the septum should look like. 
and I think it is flawed. I think the traditional teaching of what should be left behind in the septum is wrong. I think that this is clearly inadequate cartilage for me. And what's often described at times is a dorsal strut that's 0 0.6 millimeters and a caudal strut that's one centimeter. Or even if we take other uh, sources that say one centimeter by one centimeter. To me, that's not enough. The more the better. In particular, at these junction points between the bone and the cartilage of the dorsal strut, at the junction point between the dorsal and caudal strut, and at the junction between the caudal strut and the maxillary crest, the more the better. If you look at how much is supporting, this is an elephant standing on its tippy toes. Uh, if you look at how much caudal septal cartilage is actually in contact with the maxillary crest, that's not enough to provide long-term decades of support. That's going to buckle, that's going to fall off easily. That's going to create a crooked nose at three points. One, two, three. So beware of that. Uh, don't follow what's written in the book, leave more support. Once we get the septum fixed in its new position, we have a nice airway. We've created asymmetries of the tip and the nostril uh, simply by doing the septum properly. The next step is the tip and the dorsum. So here we have outlined the cephalic trim. And here we have outlined in general what we're achieving with the dorsum in cases of dorsal hump surgery. Obviously, there are other types of noses that we have to deal with where dorsal augmentation is required. Um, that can be even more simple through the endonasal approach, through the introduction of cartilage and various material onlay grafts. Uh, but for now, we're going to uh, highlight the dorsal reduction and we're going to start with the tip. So cephalic trim, again, we're taking out cephalic cartilage in order to allow for a dead space to be created that allows upward rotation of the tip cartilages um, at, the, uh, at the dome. And we don't want to go too far laterally. This even is a little bit aggressive. This will lead perhaps to some retraction, but it depends on what you've done here laterally. If you've placed a lateral curl strut graft, which you can do through the endonasal approach, then it's going to flatten out this curved cartilage and that's going to add length in this area, or I should say uh, width in this area, to flatten out that curved, uh, uh, vertically curved segment of the lower lateral cartilage. So it's going to actually effectively lengthen or widen this segment uh, of the cartilage. And so that's going to take care of your dead space, and it's just going to thin out this region uh, at the cephalic and medial segment of the lower lateral cartilage. Remember that we're trying to achieve a nice supra tip break, a nice tip defining point, an infra tip lobule, and an infra tip break, and of course a nice nasolabial angle. We want the tip to lead uh, the dorsal profile by one or two millimeters, and we want to create in general rotation upward, or in some cases if patient comes in with an over-rotated what they might call pig nose, uh, we may want to derotate the tip of the nose. And there are various techniques that can be utilized, including trimming the septum in different ways. For example, at the anterior septal angle to increase rotation, at the posterior septal angle to decrease rotation, uh, and similarly to affect projection of the tip of the nose, uh, we can perform lateral curl steel. We can introduce a septal extension graft, a, a calumellar strut graft, um, various things that can be done uh, to increase projection and rotation. We can introduce for the bulbous tip, as I mentioned, cephalic trim for very, very conservatively done and very uh, minor refinement. Uh, we could do cart uh, cartilage suturing at the tip, um, but beware of asymmetries in that, uh, in that uh, technique. How do we access those areas? There are three basic incisions that we want to make. Uh, we want to make either an intercartilaginous incision, a transcartilaginous incision, or that's also termed an intracartilaginous incision. And we want an infracartilaginous incision, also termed a marginal incision. So these are the three different incision, incisions that we want to use and be very familiar with in endonasal rhinoplasty. Of course, for external rhinoplasty, 
we want to be very familiar with the infracartilaginous or marginal incision as well. So the intercartilaginous incision is the most basic endonasal rhinoplasty technique, and that is utilized when no tip work is required, or if you're going to access the tip cartilages through the retrograde approach, meaning that you've made an intercartilaginous incision, and then you're going to dissect backward onto the lower lateral cartilage at the tip area here in order to access the cartilage of the lower lateral segment. Um, but in general, intercartilaginous incisions for me are utilized if I need to do a dorsal reduction primarily for the cosmetic portion of the operation. Because in this fashion, I can bypass the entire tip segment uh, because all of the tip cartilages are uh, caudal to where my operation is taking place, which is starting the most caudal aspect at the lower segment of the upper lateral cartilage which is what defines the intercartilaginous incision. It's at the caudal border of the upper lateral cartilage. And here's what it looks like. And that incision is made bilaterally. Uh, and that allows you symmetry in the healing process and excellent visualization of the dorsum. And then using a scissor or using a knife, you elevate the skin soft tissue envelope over the dorsum of the nose. I may also want to use a transcartilaginous incision. That's probably the second most common technique that I would utilize uh, for refinement of the tip. And why do I like that? Because I can leave intact this caudal edge of the lower lateral cartilage, leave it intact to the skin so that there's less variability to the healing process for the tip cartilages. And here's what that looks like in the patient. Uh, this is a transcartilaginous incision. So here's the upper lateral cartilage. Here's the lower lateral cartilage all the way down to here. This is the scroll area where there's overlap between the lower lateral and upper lateral to varying degrees, depending on the anatomy. And I'm making an incision through the vestibular skin and through the lower lateral cartilage uh, at the dome. And I define in my mind's eye where I want the tip uh, prominence to be. So here's that incision. And then I remove that cartilage. And you can see in a very simple way, we have nice symmetrical excisions uh, in the medial segment to create a narrowing and a slight rotation of the tip. The delivery approach is a combination of two different incisions, the infra cartilaginous or marginal incision and the intercartilaginous incision. And this is basically a bipedicled flap that's based laterally and medially for blood supply that allows us then to introduce the entire lower lateral cartilage into view so that different um, manipulations of that cartilage can take place. So here's the marginal incision being made and we're dissecting on the lower lateral cartilage using a hook to pull that bipedical flap out and then using a different type of blunt tipped hook or scissor or hemostat to present the lower lateral cartilage to us. And once it's presented to us, we can do a cephalic trim, we can do a transdomal suture, we can do a vertical dome division, all under direct view. So here's an example of such an incision. Intercartilaginous incision bilaterally, transfiction incision, that's complete bilateral transfiction incision. Now a marginal incision where this is the caudal edge of the lower lateral cartilage extending the incision along the length from lateral to medial. And you recognize this incision because that's the marginal incision along the lower border of the lower lateral cartilage medially. And then we start with blunt and sharp dissection of the skin soft tissue envelope off those underlying cartilages until we get them into clear view, bring them out and present them to ourselves for direct visualization. We can do a cephalic trim as depicted here we can do a uh, vertical dome division and then perhaps undermine in order to allow for overlap of those segments, securing them with 5OPDS, transdomal, interdomal to narrow and uh, equalize the tip. Here's a cephalic trim that's used as a cap graft. Here's a structural type tip graft 
to support the newly placed cartilages in their new position. And here's some examples of refinement of the tip utilizing that technique. For more aggressive narrowing of the tip, even more aggressive, here's that patient with the tip graft, even more aggressive tip refinement, rotation, and so forth. Dorsal reduction, most commonly done through the intercartilaginous or transcartilaginous, engage the blade to uncap the roof of the nose, then insert your Rubin osteotome. I like the wider, the better, 14 millimeters. Take down the bony portion in order to preserve a strong, high and straight osteocartilaginous dorsum. So what we want to do is uh, create a 36 degree angle between the dorsum and the facial plane. Skin soft tissue envelope elevated, excellent exposure of the dorsum through this endonasal approach, getting the skin flap elevated, Joseph periosteal elevator introduced in order to elevate the periosteum off the nasal bones. I like to use the 11 blade to, to, uh, to reduce the cartilaginous dorsum. Then I introduce the Rubin osteotome, tap, 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 et cetera, and take out the bony dorsum. And then look at this excellent, excellent visuals, visualization all the way up to the bony dorsum through the endonasal approach once the cartilage is reduced. And then to polish off edges, I'll use the rasp, either the push rasp as demonstrated here, or the st more standard pull rasp in order to refine the edges of the bone and then lateral osteotomies to bring together an open roof, maintaining a strong high and straight dorsum and very slight refinement of the tip. There are other ways to bring down the dorsum. Here are some mechanical ways uh, through electrical supplies. I also like the piezo uh, very, very much uh, for this technique. Although uh, uh, with the COVID uh, we're uh, hesitant about aerosolizing. Um, it's up for debate and yet to be determined. It's probably safe with all the measures of safety that we take. Uh, and it's a topic to discuss. I think there are many ways we can make it a safe way uh, to, uh, to perform, even use, utilizing the piezo. Um, but we could do different techniques for the dorsum and achieve that all through the endonasal approach. We can also take cartilage from the middle third in this polybeak deformity, an infantile nose and a patient who's got a very low root of the nose and we wanna bring the root up to here. So we take this cartilage and move it up to the, um, to the radix and give him a more masculine looking nose, a more mature male looking nose. And we can do that here uh, very easily endonasally. And then finally, what I'd like to talk about is, you know, in having a discussion about endonasal, do not get me wrong. As I mentioned, I love the external approach and I even love more incorporating what we learn from the end external approach into the endonasal operation. And by understanding deeply, as we talked about the shortcomings of reduction rhinoplasty, we can apply those structural grafting techniques to the endonasal operation. And it's a beautiful thing to do. So if we reduce the tip conservatively, in a very symmetrical way, we can then use cartilage that we take from the septum and introduce it as spreader grafts placed endonasally. So we can maintain or widen the middle third of the nose, even in a reduction of the middle third uh, with the use of spreader grafts of varying thickness. Here's a precise pocket created for spreader grafts. Here's a precise pocket created for columellar strut graft, or we can apply the tongue and groove techniques utilizing the the native septum if it happens to be long or an extension of the septum if it happens to be short in order to provide long-term stable tip support. Here's retrograde dissection between the medial crura in order to apply either a columellar strut graft or a septal extension graft. A rim graft in order to provide into the dead space at the lowest portion of the margin of lower lateral cartilage, we can apply a rim graft either prophylactically or for correction of alar retraction, a nice structural rim graft uh, to provide good support at the lower rim. So an incision is made marginally, a limited incision. If we haven't done a delivery approach, dissect a precise pocket here, introduce the cartilage graft and close it with two easy stitches. And here's an example of such a patient using spreader grafts, 
osteotomies to narrow to uh, straighten out the bones, um, the alar margin, alar rim graft, tongue and groove to deproject the tip and to provide support for the tip, and deprojection of the tip to provide nice triangulation of the tip, take away the slit like nostrils that we've created for her. So the endonasal rhinoplasty works very well for the proper patient. It certainly works very easily for patients with nice nasal tips uh, that are natural. Don't look at every nose and say, I must do a tip refinement on this patient so that I can show beautiful results on the table at five minutes after surgery is completed on Instagram and that that's the judge of what an outstanding result is. Because remember, rhinoplasty is a long-term proposition. And what looks great on the table through aggressive tip work, aggressive dorsal reduction, and aggressive osteotomies may not look so excellent at one year, three years, five years, and beyond. Skin contracture is perhaps the greatest force of rhinoplasty surgery. And there is a philosophical dis difference, though there's a meeting point in a well done external approach and a well done endonasal approach. And that meeting point is an understanding of tension and forces of contracture on the nose. In the structural external approach, we take into account those healing forces that are going to be very, very strong uh, over the long term by building outstanding structural grafts, oftentimes requiring supplemental cartilage from the rib or from the ear and so forth, because of the fact that we understand the contractile forces that's gonna distort the nose over time. Well, in endonasal rhinoplasty, and the reason I said this is the ultimate in preservation, we preserve all those structures to withstand the forces of scar contracture over the course of a patient's lifetime. We preserve those structures intact rather than taking them apart and repositioning them when possible. But when necessary, we take it apart. We undo the nose because just like scar contractor is a problem, soft tissue adhesions are a problem that will limit our ability to get the nose to be uh, straight if it's crooked because of cartilage attached from old trauma in an abnormal position. Many cases don't require major changes or precision of the tip and therefore don't require external visualization for improved lower lateral cartilage visualization. I would tell the young surgeons that part of the armamentarium of a complete rhinoplasty surgeon should include the endonasal rhinoplasty approach and understanding the septum and understanding the uh, mechanics of healing over the long term are a key part of embracing endonasal rhinoplasty. So again, thanks so much to Sorsa, Stuart, Cameron, Brian, the whole team, you guys are awesome, and it's great to be part of this team. Thank you so much. Oren, thank you. That was an exceptional lecture, hey? Um, I, I, really, you've covered so much, and, and the way you've done it is, is phenomenal. We've got a couple of minutes. If people have any questions, uh, please, you can type them on YouTube, or you can type them uh, here, and we'll go through them. Um, Amir has very kindly put on the link for the CME evaluation for Oren. So if you go on that link, you can click on that and, and complete that. Um, so, okay, I wanna ask you a question while some more are coming up. What percentage of your surgeries are you doing endonasally? I would probably say about uh, 60, 70%. Wow, eh? okay, that's great. And that's eh? been stable over the course of many years with little ups and downs, you know, when I learn a new technique in one or the other and I want to uh, try it out, uh, then I'll have maybe a, a, a blip in the, uh, where I'm doing more external or more endonasal, but in general, uh, it, over my career, it's been about 60 to 70%. Okay, and Oren, what would you say, say for example, you've got a resident and they, they are going to attempt an, an endonasal approach. Would you, if, if they get stuck, would you then say to them, change over and try and open up the nose. Uh, what were your thoughts around that? Uh, yeah, I, would, uh, I wouldn't hesitate in the midst of a case, uh, even for myself uh, to do that. Um, in fact, I had a case just last week, which was admittedly the first time in a long time 
uh, where I really had to do that. And the reason for that was the severity of the septum uh, and what was required to reconstruct that uh, ultimately required me to stabilize um, the septum in the new position. And I wasn't confident that that was going to maintain itself over the long term with the limited uh, access uh, to fixation of that septum in the new position. So for my own case, I, I was willing to do that. So certainly as a resident or learning, uh, I would certainly say uh, you always have that as a backup. And that's a great point. You can always fall back if you're used to doing external. And clearly the visualization is much better externally. Uh, and if you're used to that in the learning process, certainly that's a great thing to know that you can always fall back to that. You haven't burned any bridges. Great. Okay. Two questions around uh, revisions is firstly, would you do the endonasal on a revision case of somebody else? And secondly, is what a question here is what is your, your own revision rate of endonasal work? Uh, I mean, all these are great questions. Uh, I would say that uh, on the revision of someone else's work where I'm not sure of what's there, uh, it just depends on what I'm looking at. If there is, um, it depends on what the deformities are. Uh, as I described in the, in the course of the lecture, uh, I can comfortably put in structural grafts through the endonasal approach. And if the structural problems are limited to, a, to the middle third or to ALA retraction, uh, I'd like to minimize the operation and provide the changes that the patient needs. Um, and there are different philosophies on that. Uh, some surgeons we know are more uh, uh, really operating for an absolute fix. Uh, so more tending to our own needs as, uh, as type A personalities looking for very defined uh, outcome. Uh, and I think that in many cases, uh, you know, we're forgetting what the patient actually is coming in for. If it's limited to ALO retraction, let's just fix that. And, uh, and so that's the first answer. The second is uh, I should do a, a study looking at my own absolute revision rates. In general, uh, I would say that um, I can only say that minimizing the rate of revision, I don't think it's a very high rate for my own revisions uh, and from endonasals. And I would say that the place where it may be the greatest is perhaps in my tips uh, because I am more, I do have a greater stomach for accepting a natural looking more broad tip than the cutesy tips that mm -hmm. some patients uh, and many of us are posting on social media and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I admit that in the last one or two years, as social media has really gone through the roof and patients uh, coming in based on what they've seen as excellent results, we are getting more uh, cutesy at the tip. And so that's that's going to change. And so doing aggressive tip work is is going to become more part of the armamentarium.